So we're welcoming back uh, State Representative Charlie Kimball uh, for another weekly wrap up of from the legislative session. And uh, welcome back, Charlie. Good How to see you, Patrick. You? Uh, I'm doing doing great. A few weeks into the legislative session now. Yeah, probably coming up on uh, on the middle of the middle of the session, right? You got town meeting coming up in a couple of weeks. Yeah, it's hard to believe. Uh, town meeting is March fourth, I, I believe. The, um, uh, the first Tuesday is the first Tuesday. Yeah. Right, it's March first. Yes. Um, so it's right around the corner. I mean, here we are, and it is uh, February eleventh. So not that that much further, and hard to believe that we're almost halfway through. It's it seems like we've been here for a long time, but it also seems like we just got started. Yeah. Uh, and f- yeah. For the uninitiated, if I might just interrupt for a second, could you just let folks know what that uh, middle, uh, so town meeting tends to be like the middle of your session. And can you just uh, explain what the significance of that time is in terms of crossover and what that means? Sure. Well, um, the legislature is, of course, comprised of two houses, the House and the Senate. And when legislation starts in one of the bodies, they have to pass it over to the other body for them to consider and pass before the end of the legislative session. So that date is called crossover. It has to be switched from one body and then transferred over to the other body. So you have to vote it out by that date. And if you don't vote it out, chances are it's not going to happen. I mean, there are some legislative uh, procedures that you can use. So uh, you can insert language that wasn't necessarily included in a bill in the budget that has to pass. Um, And that's been a technique that's been used before. Uh, as a way to get something uh, through the finish line or across the finish line that didn't make it for crossover. But generally, if you don't make it by that date in the week after town meeting day, town meeting week, uh, then it doesn't go anywhere. It's dead for the session. Mm-hmm. And what bills are you working on that uh, have that momentum that are going to make it to crossover? Well, one that we really have to get through, we're working on this big workforce development bill, and it's really trying to pull in all these different stakeholders. And some are education providers, uh, some are service providers uh, that are, you know, run internship programs. Uh, we're dealing with the Career and Technical Education Centers, Agency of Education, Department of Labor, uh, Regional Development Corporations. We're talking to all these different folks about what that workforce development system should look like. And so it's a pretty complex uh, network, and we're really trying to build that into the bill to figure out how do we meet our short-term employment needs, or workforce needs, and how do we really improve our long-term workforce development system. So it's got so many moving parts, and right now we've taken so much testimony that we have to dis- Fill it down into something that makes sense from a legislative standpoint. Um, that's so. We the the common phrase is don't try to boil the ocean. You know, don't try to do too much. Do that. what's yeah. Don't don't do too much. Just do what is possible. And uh, and we're just trying to figure out what that looks like and still be meaningful. Because we can we can pass something that doesn't mean anything, but why do it? So we get we have to really get those important points in place so we can pass that. So that that's the big one. And, you know, if we don't move more quickly, we're at risk of not meeting our deadline, but we will meet our deadline because this is the biggest issue that the state faces right now is a workforce development and a workforce shortage. And uh, we've got a lot of, I wouldn't say pressure, but there's a lot of uh, interest within the, within the House and certainly within the Senate. And so we have this deal with the Senate. We're going to work on workforce development issues. Uh, and then the Senate's going to work on economic development issues, and then we're going to switch those at crossover. So they get to then work on what we did, and we get to work on what they did. So you do have a lot of synergy between the House and the Senate Economic Development Committee, so you, you all work together? Uh, we we agree to divide and conquer a little bit. We don't always agree on what the other body does, so that's always interesting. So. What they think is economic development when it comes over to us, we might not agree. Uh, And same with what we pass over to them. Um, And we always like to point figures at one another and say, well, we did the work. Why would they screw it up? Uh, And so it's always kind of entertaining that way. And uh, but most of the time we've got a good relationship. At least we have an agenda as to um, as what they're working on, what we're working on, so that we we're not duplicating work. Uh, we've done that before. It's not very productive. So this is the best way for us to do it. Uh, 
And so, Charlie, we, we took last week off. We've been doing these uh, weekly Friday sessions, these segments that we've been recording through the legislative session. And, and, and because we're now it's been a couple of weeks, I'm sure there's a lot else to, to catch us up on. So in, if you could summarize the last couple of weeks, what, what have you been up to and what are some of the, 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 the highlights? No, there's there's some key highlights. Points. Yeah, there's some key points. Well, today, and this is February 11th, the, the governor vetoed a bill that we passed. It was uh, H-157. And this was a bill that would require residential contractors to register with the Secretary of State. Uh, and right now, residential contractors are not really regulated. There's no licensing in place for them. So it's the lightest form of regulation is to require them to register if they ever did more than $3,500 in business in a year uh, or any one contract, I guess. Um, and so it had some other provisions, not only registering, and then uh, you had to pay for registration. Uh, and that was a $75 fee if you're an individual or 200 for an organization. And then if you entered into a contract that was worth more than $3,500, you'd have to sign a, um, you'd actually, if you, if you had a project that was worth more than $3,500 in time and labor, uh, then you would have to have a written contract. Uh, that's part of that agreement. And then also, a contractor would have to have insurance of a certain dollar amount. Um, and the governor vetoed this bill um, just today, thinking that, in his explanation anyway, he said that it posed too much on the small contractors and that it would favor those larger organizations that are really set up and more sophisticated to have contracting systems and software and also have, already have the insurance. Um, you know, I... He may be right in that sense of uh, smaller contractors not having some of that computer sophistication in the contracts and, and the insurance, but this is an industry where there's a lot of people that with a, a hammer and a belt consider themselves a contractor, and there's a lot of, I wouldn't say fraud, but there's a lot of damage done uh, because people uh, will enter into what they think is a, a good faith contract, a verbal contract with a contractor, and find that uh, what gets what comes out is either not what they counted on or costs way more than they thought it would. Um, and in other states, uh, residential contractors are regulated really uh, thoroughly, and we don't have those same standards uh, in Vermont. So it's it was really billed as a consumer protection issue to protect consumers from fraudulent behavior by contractors. Now, I, I have personal experience with contractors where I've had no problems whatsoever. Uh, and there have been times when it's been, um, you know, an issue as to, okay, you said it was going to cost X amount. Uh, and then we get into a bit of a negotiation. But, you know, some are taken advantage of. Um, and then there are also some contractors that get taken advantage of by their customers. So this, you know, to have a, con a written contract is, was really supposed to aid both of them and really spell out as to what the obligations were. But that bill is uh, vetoed. I don't know if we're going to try to override that veto. Uh, I don't think we have enough votes in the House in order to override it, but we'll see. So that, that's yeah. one big one. Yeah, I read the official statement that came from the, the governor, and uh, in it, I, I think... Uh, he had mentioned that you know at a, his main one of his main concerns was at a time when there's this um, you know ho housing stock uh, problem where we need to you know this is just one one additional barrier and he was uh, fearful that that would uh, impede upon um, you know growing the housing stock. Yeah, I can hear that, but it's it's not that big of a deal. I mean, to just register, you're not you're not saying that somebody has to have certifications. That's all voluntary. But just to register, that's not too onerous of a uh, of a process. To enter into a written contract, I still think that's not a bad idea um, when you're talking about a contract for uh, a significant dollar amount. Thirty five hundred dollars may be a little too low. Um, you know that you're you're up around thirty five hundred dollars after a couple of days of work sometimes. But so so two other big ones. We actually the house passed two. Um, two constitutional amendments since we last talked. Uh, I think we might have talked about the one on slavery to clarify the Vermont Constitution to make sure that it was clear that slavery and indentured servitude were not permitted or are not permitted in, in Vermont. The second one, which we just voted on this week, 
is called Proposition 5, uh, and that really enshrines reproductive liberty in the, in the Constitution. Um, and it, it reads, uh, this adds an article to the Constitution, because before we talked about the one in slavery, it actually just takes that language out and changes it, but doesn't show that record. This adds a new article into the Constitution, uh, and it says that an individual's right to personal reproductive autonomy is central to the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life course. Uh, and so it's, it's not female, it's male and female. Um, so it's really to in, ensure that, that a person, an individual has the right to uh, decide whether or not they want to use contraceptives, whether or not they want to maintain their gender, um, and whether or not they want to have, be sterile or not. And, uh, so, or, or, and what most folks think about it is it does uh, enable and protect someone's ability to have an abortion uh, if they want to do that. So that's, that was a big deal that got passed this week. So rarely do two constitutional amendments get voted on and now it goes to the voters. So in November, the voters of Vermont get to approve or deny that those two constitutional amendments. Yeah, and that was, uh, yeah, certainly the, the the second one, their Proposition 5 was uh, made national news. Yeah, uh, you know, and I did get some correspondence uh, about it, both pro and con from constituents. And um, some I got some postcards that I just pulled out of the mailbox here at the State House. And uh, if anybody wants to contact me, please send me an email. Uh, and so it's just the most direct way to get information and uh uh, fastest anyway. Do you find, so are you pretty responsive on email? I am. Yeah, I, I know am. different legislators prefer different modes of communication, so you prefer the email. I do. I like email uh, mm -hmm. because it provides a written record as well as easy to respond to. Uh, written postcards that are, you know, uh, just, um, you know, there, there are some people that write postcards or write letters. That's great. I'll write back to them. Uh, and I, I enjoy receiving the written ones, but the ones that are like uh, sponsored by an organization and they just put their name on the bottom. Um, it's not as meaningful, but it's still good to hear what their uh, their intentions are for sure. Yeah. And you can manage all of that email. There's, it's certainly There's a, a lot, lot of it, I would imagine. <clears throat> Sometimes I, I miss emails, uh, to yeah. be totally honest. I, I, uh, I wish I could say that I get every single email and don't miss any, but there are some that I do miss. And uh, unfortunately, some people have had to ping me back and say, hey, you never responded. And and it's not in my intent, but it's just, it's a high volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, Charlie, uh, do you have anything else to leave us with? And I know we, we, we will uh, we'll, we'll hopefully hear from you again next week. Uh, but uh, as far as we bring this Friday, February 11th to a close, uh, I wanted to give you a uh, any last words? No, I, I think uh, the state house is pretty excited about Ryan Cochran Siegel coming in second in the Super G in the Olympics. That was really great. Uh, and Jacob Ellis uh, winning the, her competition as well. Uh, you know, and the, the, it's great to just to the, there is an Olympic vibe and Olympic spirit in the state house. Uh, we're all paying attention to what's going on there. And um, great to see Vermont represented. It has been. It has been. I've been watching a little bit of the coverage uh, at, at night uh, here and there and during, uh, you know, it's nice to see these, these, you know, because they haven't been able to have spectators. So everybody is here in Vermont cheering on their family member. And uh, it's been great to see the Cochran's uh, get a little coverage on TV as well. What was um, what was really cool for me is I uh, one year in college I uh, coached alpine skiing at Cochrane Ski Hill, oh, and I got to, yeah, and it was great. I got to meet yeah. the entire Cochrane family, including yeah. Barbara Ann and yeah. and Bobby and Marilyn and Lindy and yeah. both the parents Mickey and Ginny, and it was great. I mean, they're wonderful people. Yeah, uh, had a great time coaching and got to know them. I, I didn't meet uh, Ryan Cochran Siegel at that point. He I don't think he was born not in '85. Probably not. Yeah. No, no, he, would, he was born in the 90s, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but I, I met uh, all the, the other, Jimmy Cochran and yeah. certainly his, um, his cousin. So it was, yeah. it was a lot of fun to watch and to see those, the, the family. What, a, what an operation. Great tradition. Yeah, sure is. Sure is. Um, yeah. It's amazing. This is a small little ski hill has produced uh, that whole bloodline of Olympians. It's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Yep, surely exciting stuff for our, our little uh, state of Vermont here. And uh, Charlie, I want to thank you once again for joining us on Fridays. Um, hopefully we'll get some more questions in. I have been trying to solicit questions from your constituents, so 
Um, hopefully we'll have a, uh, some to ask you um, for next week. And I understand that you will be participating also in um, the Okemo Valley Regional Chamber of Commerce's legislative forum on Monday the 21st. So I'll also see you then. Right, right. Looking forward to it. Oh, and and if your viewers have any suggestion about really good diners in Vermont, <laughs> I want to know what they are. Is that right? I'm doing a diner tour. Yeah, I'm doing a diner tour. And I've already hit a couple of the Creek uh, Diner up in Bethel and also the Wayside Diner and uh, Barry, Barry mm -hmm. Montpelier Road. Love going to diners. So if uh, we should have a contest of what's the best diner in Vermont. Favorite diners in Vermont. I love it. Okay, yeah. great. All we'll right. put that out there. All right. Cool. We'll have a great weekend. All right. Thanks, Patrick. You too. Thank you. Bye.